Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to look at expansionary monetary policy again, but uh, instead of the Montrose model, we're going to use the Keynesian model. So my previous video provides a step-by-step -step, um, graph and analysis of expansionary monetary policy using the Montrose model, but we're going to do the same thing with the Keynesian model or the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Okay, so this video again, expansionary monetary policy. We're going to remember that demand side policies are government interventionist policies seeking to influence aggregate demand, thus it's called demand side, and they can do that through either fiscal or monetary policy. Fiscal policy is the central government manipulating uh, income taxes, corporate taxes, and government spending to impact aggregate demand. And monetary policy is looking at the central bank's ability to manipulate the supply of money and impact the interest rates, which will then impact aggregate demand. So that was explained in a little bit more detail in the previous video. So let's go ahead and uh, graph this step by step, and then we will analyze it. So here we have two graphs. Graph A is a money market graph. We're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis, the rate of interest on the y-axis. We see that we have a perfectly inelastic supply of money curve, labeled SM1. It's perfectly inelastic because at any one point in time, you only have a fixed quantity of money in circulation. And the demand for money is downward sloping, labeled DM1, or demand for money 1. In graph B, we have... Uh, we're measuring the real GDP level of productive output on the x-axis and the price level or average price of goods and services in a national economy on the y-axis. We have the Keynesian aggregate supply curve with its three sections. Section one is horizontal, section two is starting to uh, slope upwards, and section three is perfectly inelastic. And then we have our downward sloping aggregate demand curve. And we will remember that aggregate demand is equal to consumption spending plus investment spending plus government spending plus exports minus imports. Okay? So we're going to illustrate demand falling into a recessionary gap. So we're going to use the example of the COVID pandemic. March governments mandating in March of 2020 for people to stay home, that reduces uh, consumption spending, Cons consumer confidence is falling, uh, people are nervous about what's happening in the economy, they don't know if they're going to lose their jobs or not, as a result of falling aggregate demand, consumption spending is falling, and that also makes businesses nervous, business confidence falling, uh, businesses not willing to take on more loans and invest into the economy, so investment spending falling. So a fall in consumption and investment spending as a result of the mandates to protect health and life uh, leads to a fall in aggregate demand. So aggregate demand falls from 81 to 82. Okay. We'll label it 82 right over here. And that creates a new equilibrium where 82 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point B, and we see that there's a fall in the inflation rate, maybe a degree of disinflation in the Keynesian model, from PL1 to PL2. And we have a fall in real GDP from YP to Y recession, which we'll call Y recession 1. As aggregate demand decreases, from 81 to 82, the quantity of aggregate supply is decreasing from point A to point B, or from YP to Y recession one. And as a result, firms begin to fire excess resources like labor. So the unemployment begins to rise from the natural rate of 5%, which is the long run average level of unemployment in the United States, to let's say 10% unemployment. So that has created a recessionary gap. What will the central bank do? The central bank will intervene, in this case immediately, 
by increasing the supply of money. And we can see in the data that in March, there was a dramatic fall in the interest rate. Before March of 2020, interest rates were about 1.75%. And then in March, it immediately drops to 0.25%. That's what we call expansionary monetary policy. How does the central bank do that? Well, they do that by printing and increasing the supply of money. And they increase that supply by buying government bonds. Um, and they can, uh, <clears throat> when they buy those government bonds, they will then provide cash to the central government or they will sell, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, they will buy government bonds and they'll increase the supply of money uh, through the central government. The central government can then spend that money and that will be an injection into the economy. Um, and so that's one illustration of uh, the increase in the supply. So supply of money shifts out from SM1 to SM2. Here we go. And that creates a new equilibrium at point D. We can see that the interest rate then falls as a result from IR1, interest rate one, to interest rate two, falling from 1.75% to 0.25%. The fall in the interest rate leads to an increase in the quantity supplied and demanded of money from QM1 to QM2. And the reduction in the interest rate will incentivize households and firms to borrow that money that is so cheap to borrow and spend into the economy. Thus, consumption spending will rise, investment spending will rise as households and firms see how cheap it is to borrow money at that very low interest rate. Now, the retail banks will offer a higher interest rate than this. This is the rate at which retail banks can borrow from the central bank. But in, again, for the household and the firm, it will still be a low interest rate. That increased consumption and investment spending due to the increased borrowing as a result of the low interest rate will shift aggregate demand outwards to close the recessionary gap. So that is the essence of expansionary monetary policy. So let's go ahead and analyze this as we would on an IB paper exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs. Graph A is a money market graph, and graph B is a Keynesian model illustrating the closing of a recessionary gap through expansionary monetary policy. In graph A, we're measuring the quantity of money on the x-axis, the rate of interest on the y-axis. In graph B, we're measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. In graph A, we'll notice that we have a uh, two perfectly inelastic supply of money curves labeled SM1 and SM2 and a downward sloping demand for money labeled DM1. In graph B, we have a Keynesian aggregate supply curve with its horizontal uh, section and then section two where it begins to slope upward and then section three that is perfectly inelastic. We have two downward sloping aggregate demand curves labeled 81 and 82. In graph B, we see where aggregate demand 81 equals Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point A. It provides an equilibrium pr price level at PL1. And we have uh, an equilibrium level of real GDP at YP or full potential GDP, where the economy is operating at its natural rate of unemployment of an assumed 5%. In the money market, we have SM1 equaling DM1 at point C, providing a equilibrium rate of interest at IR1, or 1.75%, with an equilibrium quantity supplied and demanded of money at QM1. As a result of the COVID pandemic in March of 2020, uh, people are mandated to stay home. The uh, anxiety of the pandemic and what will happen to the economy reduces consumption and investment spending due to the reduced consumer and business confidence. Uh, as a result of the reduced consumption investment spending, aggregate demand decreases from 81 to 82, creating a recessionary gap where we can see where 82 equals the Keynesian aggregate supply curve at point B. We have a fall in the price level from PL1 to PL2, thus there is disinflation appearing in the economy. 
And due to the fall in aggregate demand and the decrease in the quantity of aggregate supply from point A to point B, firms begin to fire excess resources like labor, leading to a rise in unemployment from 5 to 10%, generating cyclical unemployment. The central bank or the Federal Reserve Bank intervenes immediately by engaging in expansionary monetary policy or expanding the supply of money. They begin to print money and buy central government bonds. That leads to an increase in the supply of money from SM1 to SM2, where SM2 equals DM1 at point D. That lowers the interest rate from IR1 to IR2, or from 1.75% to 0.25%, increasing the quantity supplied and demanded of money from QM1 to QM2. As a result of the fall in the interest rate, it will incentivize households and firms to borrow money at that low interest rate and spend into the economy, increasing consumption and investment spending, thus 82 shifts out to 81, closing the recessionary gap. The increase in aggregate demand will lead to an increase in the quantity of aggregate supply. Firms will begin to employ resources like labor, lowering unemployment from 10% back to 5%, and creating a level of demand pull inflation as the price level rises from PL2 to PL1. Okay, so that's it. Here you have uh, the last video regarding expansionary monetary policy as applied to a Keynesian aggregate supply curve. If you have any questions, feel free to comment, and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.